So coming out in the morning, it got down to 30 last night. So that's pretty cool. But interesting to see what's dead and what's not. I just chopped off a Tetsukabuto here. That's a nice looking. Good tasting Japanese style squash. Nutty. Uh, all the good things I think of a Japanese style squash without being susceptible to uh, midsummer insects. So, lining some things up here. This one, I don't know what's up with the on the skin of this. That's something maybe I want to select out of. Because some do that and some don't. And I don't know, it's, some of them are maybe ones that were not mature enough on the vine, so they were sort of later in the plant's cycle. Because some of these, you know, they go through, you can get something like eight per vine, maybe. So, that may have been what happened with that. But, so, yeah, pretty, pretty zapped. I like calling it zapped. Weirdly, uh, this tomato is fine. So, yeah, go figure. And it is, I think it really is interesting to look at what gets damaged by frost and what doesn't. Uh, some people have theories about this, like that if you have a high enough bricks in your leaves, then that acts as kind of an antifreeze. And, I mean, let's just say that there is some variation and that's something that you can probably select for. Uh, but anyway, here's a zucchini I've had my eye on for a while. But the plant, yeah, is uh, that's that's pretty zapped. That's, but then there's some parts that are, aren't well, so interesting to consider. You know, there may, I think there's not going to be uh, another frosty morning for maybe another week or so, is what the, the weather forecast was saying. So it'll be interesting to see what still kind of is hanging on and what isn't. Although I'm getting pretty anxious to just clear a lot of this space out. So maybe leave some vines intact and see what, you know, we'll keep, we'll keep holding on. Uh, cause although it's not producing fruit, I do think it is just interesting to see how, you know, some plants react to it. Teosinte doesn't seem to be showing any, uh, problem in the leaves that I can see from the cold. So, I don't know, it may, it may keep doing its thing. Uh, although, you know, the pollen, ones that seem to be shedding pollen are kind of few and far between. But, <laughs> this could be interesting. We'll see. I'm not sure how, uh, you know, the I'm not sure how the seeds come out on this, so. If you're familiar with corn, this is like a strange version of corn. A mutant. This is kind of a mutant. Well, this is the original. This is the thing that corn, corn became. But it's, uh, yeah. If your eyes are trained to looking at corn, this is kind of funny. but it is still plugging away. It doesn't seem to be showing signs of uh, adversity to the cold. Here you can see most of the leaves. Some of the tomato plants here, but some not. Matt's wild cherry seems to be still kicking. On this plant as well, some are looking better than others. 
This is Berkeley tie dye. This one I planted way too late, but I wanted to try anyway. And I'm pretty close, pretty close to a usable tomato on both of these. One tomato each. <laughs> uh, so, pretty bad luck with heirloom tomatoes this year. Just because I tried to direct seed them and it just nothing, nothing took. But in the meantime, it was, I got too busy with other stuff. Before I knew it, I was like, oh, I don't really have any heirloom style tomatoes going right now. But I think I'll at least be able to get some seed, seed safe off of that. So that's all good. Gobo seems fine, but uh, yeah, this sort of sets Kabuto. I think that's what it is, but the strange thing is I don't recall planting any Tets Kabuto here. All I had was a pack. What I thought I was planting was a bunch of stuff that was grafted rootstock. And there were some plants where the original, right, I thought it was just some moshada. I just picked kind of a pack out of some save seeds that was unlabeled but looked like moshada seeds. And anyway, so I think maybe that's what this is. Actually, I don't know. The stem, kind of halfway. Not quite a maxima, but any so I don't know. Yeah, it looks like there's a Tetsukabuto in here somewhere. But the grafting thing, I would say, the plants that were grafted did seem to look like they were took off. Get a little more melon vigor than I thought I would. Okay, this is the Hakusai. Grex, Chinese cabbage, and it is looking awesome. Well, it seems to be quite a bit of variation in the foliage. So, just really fun to look at. And this is one of those, this is one of those cool, fun to watch crops. And I'm excited to eat this stuff too. Some of the leaves are getting a little eaten. So maybe I could, that's, you know, use that as a selection criteria when I'm thinning these out. So we got lots of different versions of the same thing here. I have a good feeling about this in terms of the you know, I think that there's a lot of a lot of hybrids here. And uh, yeah, I don't know. They just look like very healthy plants. If you want to see? Uh... <laughs> so again, yeah, it's very strange. You know what got, does and doesn't get dusted. You know, but. Some stuff, here we have, here we have it. Uh, stuff that got frosted, stuff that got zapped by the cold. But interesting to see what does and doesn't react. So here in the Moshada pit, or whatever I have going on here. Some stuff's still hanging on, but many of these vines look zapped. And just in time. Just still get a little cover crop in to see what's going on. The understory may be a little bit more interesting than I'm than I'm expecting, actually. I may just do a you know a row of this today. Collect everything, move it, move the yield out of the way, 
and then just mow over it. Suck up a little of that stuff that's just hanging out on top of the soil. And then plant some barley or something. Pretty interesting to note that on this side of the garden, so this is that's the sunny side, this is the shady side, uh, there's very little burn, leaf burn. Curious. Not seeing much damage with the tomatoes here either. I gotta say, I think I think that the Matt's Wild cherry genetics are changing. I see some variation already. Either it's maybe not as locked down originally. If it is a wild variety, you know, that's that's a distinct possibility that this may be. It's just a really well-developed land race. Uh, anyway, interesting to note that over here, the plants are doing just fine. Do they have thicker sap over here for some reason? Is there something about growing in the shade that kind of stresses you a little more? It's entirely possible, right, that there's, you know, all sorts of interactions that we can't really fully understand. But that we're here for the ride, you know, when cool things happen, we can kind of just push it forward without needing to know why it's happening or really how it's happening. So we can think of nature in the abstract. Uh, we apply abstraction to nature in interesting ways. I think going forward, there's you know, a pretty distinct possibility that uh, there could be kind of you know an agricultural revolution where agriculture is treated more like physics than whatever it currently is. And so by that meaning sort of a lot of abstraction, thinking in terms of what populations can do as opposed to what a single cultivar can do. But that if you really ride this wave, you know, or sort of set up a sail to catch enough winds to use a little technology, use a little human intuition, you know, to really ride with nature in a, an elegant way. I think that there's some interesting things that can unfold over time. And ultimately, I think that can also mean that even a sort of the visual experience, as well as I guess the you know the food experience, uh, can be you know. I take it as a goal, you know, that this food should be not just easy to grow, easier to grow, but way more fun to grow. Uh, you know, I would wish upon everybody sort of a Jack and the Beanstalk kind of experience. Uh, or even just, you know, compost. Like, if all you do is take your vegetable scraps and throw them in a patch in your yard, like, I guarantee that there will be some volunteers and that you will see sort of the, the miracle of nature. You can get something from nothing. I think if you just do that, you're putting all your 
vegetable scraps, your seed, you know, seeds, whatever. Uh, I, anyway, I wish everybody sort of have this, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk kind of experience where something grows ridiculously well and tastes ridiculously better than what you could buy at the store. I don't think that's too that I don't think that's too much to ask. And for it to be done in a sort of natural setting, right? To be for it to be sort of a psychedelic experience for the human using your seeds. Uh so it can be, you know, as beautiful and as expressive uh, and as human, you know, that this, this can be sort of human art as it unfolds before our eyes. I think it could get that good, if especially, you know, we sort of uh, start mashing, you know, abstraction up against with other abstractions, and sort of painting, using the sort of paintbrush that land race breeding and, you know, qualitative traits selection can give you in the garden. Uh, so there's interesting, you know, you could think of having a population that's tall and a population that's sweet, you know, and the po the, those two populations are constantly getting bred against each other, and, you know, you can then make it so the tall and sweetness, right? Somehow these two abstractions can sort of become one genetically. So tall and sweetness then becomes sort of a word within the genetic vocabulary or syntax of the plant. I think it's possible. Uh, again, just treating it as a sort of computational system in nature, but one in which you don't need to know how it works, you just need to know sort of that it works and understand what you can do with it. And I think that this way of thinking, I think this is also helpful to the user in a way it helps sort of humans frame their own experience in terms that they can understand. Uh, and I think we need a lot of that right now as well. But to create and to maybe, you know, to package for people, you know. Imagine this as a profession. A guy who says, all right, if you live, if you live around me, I can, I can sell you a mix of seeds that will give you with pretty good probability, you know, if you just mow your lawn off and <laughs> plant this in and then put your, put your mowed lawn on top of it, I can guarantee you at least a, this level of experience, right? Or, you know, this, this sort of thing will probably unfold before you. Uh, right, this is sort of like, you know, a, a set of fireworks, uh, but, you know, that you, that you put out in the field. And it will look really cool, and it will open up your mind to how nature works together as an ecosystem. Uh, and that's fun to think about. You can save seed from this. Oh yeah, here's the other thing. It uh, works really well. So it grows really well and you can save seed from it. Or you can do nothing, and some seeds would get saved automatically. 
uh, and yeah, I think that's sort of the version, the new sort of version of a seeds, a seeds person. I don't know what you know, food shaman is what uh, Joseph Lofthouse calls himself, and you know that's that's badass. There used to be this uh, picture of him on his website if he went, and it was just like him standing in like a snowy field or something, or maybe it was a graveyard. I think it was a graveyard. You know, all kind of bundled up, looking kind of shaman-like, and it's like Joseph Lofthouse, food shaman. Very cool to think about, but um, also, yeah, if we kind of unleash this technology onto, uh, you know, people sort of being really creative with this. And I think that this, the fun thing about this way of looking at growing food is that you can kind of, uh, you know, be creative and improvisational. In playing music, you know, there's, if you've played improvised music before, you know the sort of the joy and exhilaration that can come from that. And I think that this, you know, this too can be that level of experience. But I think, you know, for people to really take it psychedelic, uh, you know, there's going to be an intersection of a lot of, you know, traditional scientific understanding, you know, and that, that all is going to think, I think, still going to be useful for people who really want to get under the hood and understand how it all works. Uh, but that it is, I think, being, if you sort of unleash it as a creative art, and, you know, show people that it's like, this is how you start a band, so to speak. You know, it's like starting a band. Uh, but that, you know, uh, everybody who bought a Velvet Underground, you know, not maybe they didn't sell very many albums, but everybody who bought one of their albums started a band, right, is sort of the... Uh, the thing that people say, it's the often quoted thing about the band, The Velvet Underground. But I think, you know, you could similarly say anybody that bought Joseph Lofthouse's, the pack of Joseph Lofthouse's seeds became a land race gardener, or at least, you know, understands the idea. And so that's really cool, you know. Uh, and so, yeah, I hope that there gets unleashed, you know, a million new breeders, a billion new breeders, everyone a breeder, you know. If we understand how intuitive it can be, I think that there's some really cool stuff that can, people will be able to do going forward. And just in the nick of time for us, because we need a lot of help reconnecting with nature so cheers to that it's beautiful in the autumn here it is all cleared out so that was most of the moshada patch uh that's gone let me show you uh, my lineup so far this is Moshara. You get the general idea. These are those big ones. The Tahitian melon. Uh, some nice dark looking ones. Uh, my intuition is that's what I'm looking for. It'll be interesting to see though with these white ones. Uh, taste wise, uh, also interesting. We'll see how these go. The Tahitian melons. Here's the uh, kabocha yield this year. Not as good as last year, actually, I don't think. Uh, but this is a delicious one. Glad to see it. These. Just putting them in these sort of groups. Uh, and then these, which I are known maximas, at least according to the, the sheet. But what I'm looking for, uh, I mean, as far as round, round stemmed ones. Honestly, in my garden, there are only these, I think three, 
Oh wait, no, there's a couple more in the shed, but uh, that's about it as far as true Maximus. Plenty of uh, Tetsukabuto. There'll be a few more of these coming in. This may not be the final, final yield haul, haul vid, uh, but it's kind of fun to look at.